Hello, and welcome to One World, One Health, where we take a look at some of the biggest problems facing our world. I'm Maggie Fox. This podcast is brought to you by the One Health Trust, with bite-sized insights into ways to help address challenges such as infectious diseases, climate change, and pollution. We take a One Health approach that recognizes that everything on this planet, the animals, plants, and people, and the climate and environment are all linked. We've talked a lot on this podcast about antimicrobial resistance, drug-defying superbugs, and how to fight them. But you can't fight what you don't know about, and world health authorities are all urging better surveillance for these infections. Dr. Wendy Muziasari has taken the lead on doing just that. She's the founder and CEO of Resistomap, a company that works with hospitals, agriculture, other industry, and governments to look for antimicrobial-resistant germs in the environment. She's joining One World, One Health to talk about why she founded this company and how it's helping. Wendy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, too. Tell me, how do you monitor the environment for antibiotic resistance? How is that different from just looking for people who are infected with resistant germs? When you go to hospital, right, when you know that you're infected with this bacteria, usually doctor will get the blood samples and then a stool or urine from your body. But when we talk about environment, so we usually look for the source of this antibiotic resistance as the pollution. And then also we want to see the impact of the spread of this bacteria spread in the impacted environment. We collect samples from wastewater the wastewater from hospital, wastewater from the slaughterhouse, wastewater from the especially antibiotic manufacturers, and wastewater from the treated wastewater treatment plant. When we talk about the spread of this resistant bacteria in the environment, we need to collect from the impacted environment, such as in the river, in the reservoir of drinking water, in the coastal area where you swim and fishing, and then, of course, in the soil, agricultural soil, where there's a manure impact. So, it's very important understanding what do you want to see first, whether it's the sources or the impacted environment. So you mentioned wastewater. How do you find these superbug germs in wastewater? When you eat, right, you of course want antibiotic. And when this comes, because antibiotic resistant bacteria will develop in your gut system. Because of course, bacteria need to, to live. So they need to be resistant when the antibiotics are present. And these bacteria are released through your waste into the sewage system. And then, of course, there it will be in the wastewater. The same in the animals. Antibiotics not only used in humans, but also in animals. So when animals consume antibiotics for a treatment or any consumption, resistant bacteria will develop in their gut and they're released through their waste also. So what goes in comes out. Yeah. <laughs> and I would love people to aware of this issue so don't think that when you go to the toilet, you flush, it means that they're gone. No, they're not, unfortunately. They're released to the environment. And if you don't stop this, if you don't mitigate the spread of this resistant bacteria, they spread in our surrounding environment and they will end up through our system back again, either when you are swimming or when you interact directly with the environment or through the food chain system. So it's very important that we need to mitigate spread of this western bacteria in the environment. What kind of organisms do you look for? So this is the difference when we're talking about the environment. In environment, we don't necessarily look at the bacteria itself, like the name of bacteria. Like when you go to the doctor, you need to know, right, what is the pathogen, what is the bad bacteria that causes infection on your body. But when we're talking in the environment, there are many bacteria there. So the problem that the genes that make bacteria resistant can be transferred between bacteria. So this is the problem. So that's why we cannot just study one organism or two certain organism, but we need to study whole bacteria from the environment. So often you're not looking for one specific bacteria. You're looking for the genes that give them antimicrobial resistance in the first place. Yes, that's true. But of course, we also monitor the pathogens itself because it's very important. So we monitor the genes that are resistant to bacteria, the genes that make the resistant bacteria spread or mobile, transport between bacteria, we call these mobile elements, and also the genes that cause infections like this Klebsiella pneumonia or any other pathogens. But the main idea here that we are using environmental DNA method, 
where we collect the DNA and we just test the genes from this DNA samples. People may have heard of this because there was some wastewater surveillance for COVID, but COVID's a virus and, and it's got to be different methodology. The problem to treat virus and bacterial DNA or this environmental DNA indeed is different. We need to monitor many genes that are uh, associated with antibiotic resistance. This is the difference with COVID because there are only maybe few genes as a marker in COVID-19, maybe like four markers to know there's COVID-19. But for antibiotic resistance, there are hundreds of thousands of known that are resistant because there are many types of antibiotics, right? At least there are 10 major antibiotics. So it means there are a lot of types of, of resistance to this 10 group of major antibiotics. And that's why we need to study kind of all these genes comprehensively and using this environmental DNA. What are some of the things you found? Unfortunately, only bad news is the pollution is everywhere and they're so really, really high. You can see that the level of resistance in some river that's supposed to be look clean, but then the level of resistance is polluted as waste from the swine farms. So that's it's horrible and it's globally. So it doesn't matter which country, which region, even in high income country, the pollution are really high. It's because many of the wastewater treatment are not really optimized to remove these microbial pollutions. So they are already spread everywhere. And you may know manure uh, antibiotic use in agriculture are really high. And the spread of from this manure application to the soil and without treatment. So then they are just spread everywhere, and especially in the regions where the sanitation are not good, then there are pollution everywhere. So what you're saying is a lot of this is from pollution, it's runoff from farms, and you mentioned swine. So pig farming, what's going on? People, farmers are feeding these antibiotics to their livestock, and then these livestock are shedding the antibiotic-resistant bacteria into the wastewater through their manure. Yes, of course. Because like, for example, usually intensive farming, they use antibiotic a lot. So they use antibiotic, as you mentioned, not only for treatment, but usually used to let them grow. I'm happy that I learned there are more country prohibit now they use antibiotics to grow as a grow promoter. But still, if you have many animals, you will use a lot of antibiotics. And as I mentioned, if you consume antibiotics, even in the animal, resistant bacteria will develop and they're released through their waste or their stool or like manure. And then if it's applied in the agriculture and there's the runoff from the farms, both from the agriculture area released to the water environment and they will spread also. Not to mention if we use them as a food, if there is no good sanitation, this bacteria could spread or contaminate our food. And this food contamination, if you are unlucky, you will be infected with resistant bacteria. It happened to my friend. He was traveling holiday, you know, get the street food. He traveled to this country every year, so he would never expect that it happened to him. And he got the street food and he was infected with Shigella that are already resistant to all antibiotics. So he hospitalized for two weeks and the doctor said to him he needed to say goodbye to his family because no antibiotics work in that hospital. It's just street food contamination, you know, you get diarrhea and you hospitalized for two weeks saying the doctors told you that no medicine work. I was so scared about this and I'm happy that actually because it's a good life insurance that he could access the very expensive antibiotics that cost $200 per shot and he need to get it twice a day for seven days that he could cure from this Shigella infection. But can you imagine if like the general people, you know, who doesn't have the insurance, who doesn't have this uh, access to high tech healthcare system, they will die simply just the food contamination. And this will happen, unfortunately, more often if we don't stop the pollution in the environment, also in our food system. Wendy, do you have personal reasons for doing this in the first place? Yeah, I think in the first place, I think it's best because I'm Indonesian. So when I brought this research after my PhD in Finland, in Finland, because everything is clean and nice, it's not so big issue. Uh, but at least I learned the technology and I want to bring this technology to my home country in Indonesia as a postdoc. So before I built a company, I did my postdoc using this technology in my home country. And this is, I start to like, oh my God, you know, like world is in the bad situation. But then I learned people don't know about this problem because they don't monitor. And I ask why people don't monitor. They don't have the technology because this environmental DNA method or this high throughput PCR or this metagenomics are really advanced. 
right? So not every country has the privilege to do this job. And I start like, oh, this is one of the reasons that I build a company to let people have the access to monitor. And then the more I let people get the access, I monitor more samples, right? So we've been monitoring over 10,000 environmental samples across 45 countries in our database. And now it soon will be 50 countries. The result, all of them are horrible, like every, almost every environment are polluted. Of course, there are some regions that are really still good. So this is one of the reasons why I start to feel more passionate about this, because I see the data, you know, like if I open this database to let people see the real situation. And that's why now our passion now is to bring this global map as the, in the UN level, so that uh, globally, every country should see the problem in their own country and understanding what is the problem in that country. Because every country has a different problem, different type of resistance, different kind of disease. Well, you know, tropical country, for example, and when you are from the four season country, will be different. Antibiotic use will be different. So that's why I want to give the access to everyone to monitor this, to understand that the problem is really, really bad. And people didn't realize it because people just focus on when they talk about antibiotic resistance, the doctors. It's true. Doctors and veterinarians are really in the bad situation because they need to cure passion, right? They need to make the animal health again, but they don't. So they don't have the energy to see how is the waste <laughs> outside of them. So this is why we need more effort from other sectors, like as a one health approach. We need like work together so that we can help doctors, veterinarians to do their job. I mean, treating people and animals to get healthy again. But then us as the environment here to work together to mitigate spread of this resistant bacteria from the hospital, from the veterinary animal farm, not spreading to the surrounding and especially not cross-contaminated, cross-pollution between the hospital to animal, animal to the hospital, making sure they just stop there. <laughs> and so the antibiotics still work. So I think that this is more why my passion being a bit more compared to others, because I see the data daily basis. And it's getting worse and worse, <laughs> unfortunately. Wendy, so how do low and middle income countries afford this kind of testing? It sounds like it's expensive. Well, it's because they don't need to invest in their own land. They don't need to invest buying this very expensive machine. They need to invest even the data structure, you know, to save storage the data. So what they need to do is just collect the sample and they pay the, the money, enough money for their sample. So it's not big, of course, still expensive compared to the standard monitoring, but still with the amount of that money, they can get very comprehensive information because usually if you like in high income country, because you have your lab, you can afford, right? Buying the consumable, buying the machine and running on your own. But in developing country, the budget is usually very limited, but then this limited budget is enough usually to, to just monitor their sample. So this is our system. We are very flexible technology. It's called smart chip PCR system. So we can study 384 genes at once. And then, or we can, let's say, flexible changes to only targeting maybe 20 genes, but we can analyze 100 samples. So it's very flexible. And that's why it's very good for the developing country because they said, oh, I have, Wendy, I have only, let's say, $10,000 budget. What are we going to do with this? And then I can play around what is the, how many samples you have. And then we know, then you can target maybe only this amount of genes. And that's why they can access. And I think one, another thing, not only just the technology, but it's the interpretation of the data. Many of them wouldn't understand. So what of this gene meaning? What does it mean, right? So we are developing also a platform, so it's intelligent platform that can help this, the non-expert by seeing the result, laboratory result, they will understand that your situation is like, let's say, red color means that is bad. And then blue color means that kind of, they, they are there, but it's still in the low abundance. So this kind of thing, I hope that by make them easy understanding, you know, not only easy access technology, but also understanding the result can have better action for them, more time for them to do action, because that's what we need now, right? More action is needed. And policymakers, we need to make regulation in place that this, you know, wastewater treatment, they should limit the spread of this pollution, especially from antibiotic manufacturer, hospitals, slaughterhouse, and animal farms, like the big sources of this resistance releasing to the environment. And have they been able to make changes in some of the places you've worked based on your findings? 
Yes, there are many countries now, for example, starting having implementation of national action plan where the environment monitoring in the environment, like the spread of this antibiotic resistance in the environment included in their action plan. So I hope that, of course, the more we are be aware of this pollution, I hope there will be more action, not just like, oh, there's a problem. We knew already the problem, but better monitoring. So we will know better where is the main source that we can put the better resource to mitigate the spread of this resistant bacteria in the point sources. Wendy, what a pleasure it's been speaking with you. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Listeners, thank you for joining us too. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. You can learn more about this podcast and other important topics at onehealthtrust.org. And let us know what else you'd like to hear about at O-W-O-H at OneHealthTrust.org. Until next time. Thank you for listening to One World, One Health, brought to you by the One Health Trust. I'm Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, founder and president of the One Health Trust. You can subscribe to One World, One Health on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on social media at One Health Trust, One Word, for updates on One World, One Health, and the latest in research on One Health issues like drug resistance, disease spillovers, and the social determinants of health. Finally, please do consider donating to the One Health Trust to support this podcast and other initiatives and research that help us promote health and well-being worldwide. Until next time.